we're going to try and stick to the actual idea here of uh, we work in Excel, but what's one of the reasons we work in Excel is we want to be able to change the numbers and see what happens. Let's be honest, there's three people for a job. It's a case of, you know, people look at the numbers and they say, OK, well, uh, is this going to pass? Is it going to fail? And of course, the correct answer is, well, what do you want it to be? So it's a case we're going to be looking here at scenario and sensitivity analysis. Now. In order to double the number of copies of a book I've sold, I have a co little competition here. Um, uh, if, if you don't get it right, you get two copies, is, uh, is the fact that um, I'm going to talk about scenario and sensitivity analysis. Can anybody tell me what the difference is between scenario and sensitivity analysis is from a modeling perspective? Mm -hmm. I don't What, just one? Sorry? What inputs? What, for sensitivity? The, the thing is known, I'm, I'm meaning that the sensitivity actually explores a range and the behavior within the range, while the scenario focuses on more like particular inputs that you're exploring as part of the scenario. It's a good answer, maybe, but given you're the only person that stuck their hand up, maybe you can, somebody can pass this book on anyway, and uh, uh, does somebody want to pass that on? Thank you, Boris. I've yeah. uh, got a little prize here, but at least... So how I define scenario analysis and sensitivity analysis is scenario analysis is when you change more than one value at a time in order to tell a story, base case, best case, worst case, whatever. Whereas a sensitivity is when you're looking at, for an agreed output, how is a particular input affecting it? And they tell different parts of the same story. So it's about trying to tell things out. Does that sort of make sense? So in my 137 slides I've got to go through here, um, I've got here that essentially we, we spend so much time making pretty charts. Uh, one of the things they say, they say that the, the, they save the best presentation to last. I'd like to point out this is not the last presentation. So uh, one of the things here is with everyone else having done all the fancy stuff with dynamic arrays, XLOOKUP and everything else, I'm left with showing you some of the old stuff in Excel, but it's still good. Uh, and one of the things here is we spend so much time making things pretty and making it look all beautiful, but what we need to do sometimes is actually think, is it that whatever value we come out with going to actually be achieved? And the answer is no, it's not. And I want to have a look at different ones. So I can read a whole load of slides out. Let's not bother. Should we go to Excel instead? Right, let's see if I can go in here. So I'm going to show you about scenario and sensitivity analysis and show you how Excel does it, first of all, and then explain why I don't do it that way. So I've got some inputs here. I've got a very simple model, and this is where I pretend I can actually see, and I need to actually put my glasses on here. Oh, there's a computer. I didn't realize. Um, I've got here units produced, 45,000, production of product A, 75%, price of product A, $100. It all begs the question, are you still awake? Uh, what I've done is I've built a little P&L down here to give me $454,344, or you can do it in LEV or euros or whatever. I'm from Australia, so dollars seems to be the name of the day here. But what I can do is I can go to the data tab, and in the what-if analysis here, there's something called Scenario Manager. Who's used Scenario Manager? Who's used it a second time? <laughs> <laughs> Just out of curiosity. So one of, one of the things here with Scenario is I can actually add some inputs in here and say, look, I want to actually uh, change some of these inputs with it in particular values. To, so, so if I go for base case, let's just do that quickly. I go base. Um, and then I'm going to go by change these inputs Let's go in here and I'll click this cell, that one, this, this. For some reason, if you start highlighting them all in one go, it doesn't seem to like that, so I'll have to do it this way. And click OK. Well, it contains a date type or formula. Which did I do here? OK, well, I've ignored it anyway. I don't care. So I've, got, I've come up here. It's OK. And then I'll hit, that's it, it's added. And then I'm going to put another one in, and I'm going to call this one. Let's go for a best case. And I can go through, OK. So I've put this one in. Oh, yes, I should have knocked one out. What I'll do is I'm going to get rid of all my costs. So uh, what my best case is going to have here, that my gross margin is not going to be 0 0.7, 45 and 51% in here. It's actually going to be, as I scroll down here, it's going to be 100% for each of these. Now, 
If I click OK, I can put these in. And I, can, I can create more if I wanted to. But I just want to produce a super summary just to show you how wonderful this all comes out. If I hit summary, and I'm just going to put it in here, I get results. It wanted to know what my actual input was. I forgot to do it because it doesn't really matter anyway. It shows me values like this, which is what bothers me a little bit, is that I don't know what the actual values are. I get J40, H11, H12. Everyone remember what they all were? But better, isn't it, if you're doing what-if analysis, don't you want to be able to change numbers in here and see how it actually affects the value? But this is all PDF. This is no good to me like this. So this is what I'm saying here. Nah, don't want to do that. That's not my idea of scenario analysis. Come to that in a minute. What I do instead, then, is I create a scenario table. And you've probably seen these. Now, you can put these in either rows or columns. For the purpose of this, keeping it simple, given I've only got limited uh, real estate here, I've done it in columns. But often when we do time series, we will actually do it in rows instead. And I'm going to use an actual function to decide which of these particular values to use. So if you see if I choose scenario one, I get this one highlighted. If I choose scenario three, I get that one highlighted, and so on. What function do you think I might have used there to do this? I heard someone say the right one. Offset. Yeah, now some people might think use VLOOKUP or index match or XLOOKUP or things like this. I'm a bit old school. I, I do a lot of model auditing. Uh, and one of the things is, but one of my old heroes is a guy called Professor Raymond Panko, who actually said that 5% of all models, 5% uh, of everything you do in modeling contains errors. What isn't no, uh, spotted so easily, though, is it's not linear. It's not 5% of everything you do. When you're beginning at the start, which is usually what the beginning, when you actually start, you will make fewer mistakes because you're getting it sorted, you've got more time, everything goes nice and happily. Where it goes wrong is when you're rushed and you're trying to do things at the end quickly. That's where things go wrong. And the problem is if you use things like VLOOKUP, index match, and things like this, and this is before, remember, the advent of dynamic arrays here, I, you would actually have to specify the table size. Now, other people here have shown you that. I, I, my, my briefing here was to show you old school Excel, so I'm just going to go back and explain offset. Now, offset has its own problems. Is everyone familiar with offset? Who doesn't know offset? Right, quick crash course in offset. Here's something I didn't prepare earlier a blank Excel workbook. So I'm going to put in here the numbers 1 and 2. Now, if I were in consulting mode, where I charge by the hour, I would now see how long it would take me to go down 100,000 rows. But uh, we'll do it this way instead and copy it down. So what offset does is you start somewhere. So we go equals offset. And it's about disposition. Not that position, but disposition. Uh, and it's about moving from a particular cell. So I'm going to start in cell A1. And then I'm going to say, right, I want to move from this cell. And you'll see the next thing's in here. We well, won't unless you've got bionic eyesight. Is it wants the no number of rows and the number of columns. And it reads left to right and down the page, except it does rows first, then columns. So if I said 2, comma 3, that means go two rows down and three columns up. So let's just close this off because my mouse keeps going down. So if I pressed Enter here now, what would the value be? 15? I heard a few of that. It's, it's always the most common answer I get. I've heard the right answer since, but yes. Yeah, a lot of people seem to go for 15. The actual answer is 16, because you start here, and you go two rows down and three across. Now, it's got more power than this. Uh, interesting things with this. Um, if I actually write the formula in here, everyone familiar with the function formula text? It's a new class of motor racing that's coming out. It's very boring just using PDF, so I'll go in here. So if I go formula text in here, this shows me this cell. If I click on A1 and I go to formulas and go trace dependence, you can see that it's in there. But if I go to the number 16 and go trace dependence, apparently it's not being used, so I can delete that value. So that's one issue with offset. The other is, it's a bit like me. It's volatile! <laughs> Sorry, you still awake? This is why they put me on in the evening. Would you believe it? I'm jet-lagged. This time yesterday, I was fast asleep. I bet you're wishing I am now. Uh, oh, sorry, I turned sideways then. You didn't see me for a second. I'm back. Uh, so, so, I always have to go somewhere twice, the second time to apologize. Um, so what I've got here is, oh my god, I look like that. I've got my hair, though, Ken. OK, so 
<laughs> um, what I've got in here is it's volatile, which means because it's a bit paranoid, doesn't know which cell's being used, it's actually recalculating everything the whole time. So be careful, use the offset function sparingly. But I think the ends justify the means here uh, it, uh, in terms of what I can do, because the fact is that if I put more scenarios in here, scenarios six and seven, I can just put scenario seven in now, and it works. Whereas uh, the danger is, if you're at the last minute, you try to change something, you can extend the table, but realize there's other formulas you've got to change. This is why I much prefer offset. Does that make sense to people? So what I've done then is I deliberately have, I've colored it in blue here to say, you know, this is deliberately blank. I've made this column blank here because the formula in here is simply offset this cell here, um, and then it's going that many columns to the right. Make sense? So I can keep extending more and more columns as I want. So I can add more and more scenarios. Uh, and, and this is really quite useful here. So the, I can put this down. Now, what I've done is I've taken those numbers and I've calculated my inputs based on this. And you can just trust me here because that's not really the point of this, to actually come up with my different scenarios. So I can put scenario one in and there's my values. And maybe I'm interested in trapping the profit after tax here of 164448 in period four. But maybe I want to also analyze what happens if I put scenario two in, 186934. And if I've really run out of material, I can put 1,000 scenarios in and show those for the next 25 minutes or so until they hook me off. The, the thing here is, how do I actually summarize that and put that in? I've seen people write macros to do that. No, don't use macros. Office Scripts is out now, so we can use that. No, don't use that either. What, what, what do you use instead, then? We've looked at tables today. Yeah? What, what other type of table is there? Is that lectern table? But what else is there in Excel? Who's used data tables? Not many of you. OK, well, be prepared to be amazed or just pretend that you are so that it humors me. With a data table, you can create either a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional data table where you can flex either one input or two inputs at a time. Hang on, Liam, you're doing scenario analysis where you're changing a lot of inputs at the time. How does this work? I've used a scenario number. It's the scenario number I'm going to flex and put those down. Does that make sense? Now I can do this in a column. I, sorry, I missed my chance there for the Lord of the Rings impersonation. <laughs> column. Thank you. It's taken you long enough. <laughs> OK, right, so what I've got in here is I, I can put my actual scenarios in here. You can put inputs along here and inputs along there. If you do that, that's flexing two, and that's called a two-dimensional data table. And you put the number you're trying to flex, the output, in here, and then use your data table. Or you can do it in a column where you put the data in. So this is what I'm going to do to start off with. I'm going to put here the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, yes, I could have used the sequence function and done sequence 7 and all sorts of other clever things, but I'm going to keep it nice and simple here. And then the output I'm going to do is this. Take that one there. 186934, and I'm going to use the formatting so that it all looks wonderful here. And then highlight all of that, you're pretty much done. You go to the data tab, we go back to what if analysis, but this time we don't go to scenario manager, we go to data table. If you click on this, well, somebody asked before, what does it take to be an Excel MVP? Let me tell you. John Peltier and I once did a presentation together where we argued what was the smallest dialogue box in Excel. And we were doing this in New Zealand. And one night over beers, we went and got every single dialogue box out and measured them. And I can now categorically say this is the smallest dialogue box in Excel. <laughs> Aren't you impressed? You can go home tonight and say, what did you learn today? <laughs> So I've got here, this is, so this is in a column, so I'm going to use the column input cell. I'm going to actually change that to be the scenario indicator here. I'm not going to do anything in the row inputs, so I don't need to put anything in, so I just click OK. Was that hard? 186934 everywhere. What on earth's going on? Well, I've either stuffed it up or it's on automatic. So if I go to uh, File Options and come in here, if I go to... Uh, in here and I go to uh, formulas, do you see I have got, uh, going on here, a common error that happens. It's not an REM album, automatic except for data tables, right? The trouble with data tables is they use a lot of memory. And so a lot of people like to switch those off. Just a little tip, 
Never do that. <laughs> right? Because nobody ever goes here. Right? It's like Doncaster. It's a case of we, we go there, we click on automatic instead, and then I'll just close this and come out of it and OK. And there you go, it's all updated with my values. How cool is that? Now, you might want to switch the data tables off, because if you have a lot in there, the, it, you, don't want to, you want to have an explicit on-off switch. So the way I do that is I create some data validation. Now, the tip we all learned from uh, uh, Fred, Frederick was actually, with data validation, make sure you colour the cell in before you move off it, so that uh, you can go and find it afterwards. Uh, so I <laughs> put that in here. <laughs> And then, so if I go Alt-DL for data validation to bring it up, I'm going to just have a list here, and I'm going to think of it like a, uh, my, I'm going to think for wife, uh, for inspiration, on, comma, off. There you go, that's what I'll actually use. And I'll click OK, uh, and then I've got here a drop-down box that is on and off. And I'll just go here, this switch, and I'll type in equals if, open brackets, this switch here says on, then do this, that should be an equal sign, just testing. Otherwise, nothing, can't be bothered to put a zero in, I'm too lazy. In fact, sometimes I'm so lazy I don't even finish my... <laughs> no, I, I once bought a book that said how to cut your homework in half, bought two copies. <laughs> Sorry. Right, teaching you nothing but you're having a laugh. Right, so press enter in here, I've got it now, do you see it's switched on and it's calculating? and off. Now, some people will actually uh, hide this row. Rather than that, I might go to Control-1 to actually format cells, and I might just go in here instead and put in here uh, that, the, the actual amount, or whatever we're calling it, profit. And I'm going to put here, and I'll, I'll show you what it is. I've made it a bit small, sorry. Let's make it so you can see that. I've actually put here Amount in speech marks, semicolon, amount in speech marks. And that means in number formatting, if it's a positive or, or zero, it will be amount. And if it's negative, it'll also be amount. If I don't do it twice, if it's a minus number that's at the top, I'll get minus amount, which will look a bit strange. And I need to make sure I look like a professional. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liam. How are you doing? <laughs> right, so click OK. Boriana is so pleased she's invited me now. So I've got this here. I've got, do you see that says amount now? Is that pretty cool? Sorry. Is that pretty cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah fine. <laughs> I'm just desperate for the love. So if I put that in here and I, I close that file down, I've actually got examples here of other data tables I've done just to uh, show you. I don't know if I've actually put it up yet. So here it is. Here's a data table example. If you don't need them, don't use them. It is the thing here. So here I've got revenue of 20,000, flexing it by a percentage. Just write the formula. Keep it simple, yeah? In this one, I've created a one-dimensional data table, uh, sponsored by Specsavers there for a second. I've got a discount rate of 8%, and I've got this as my cash flows, and I've worked out an MPV. If you're not quite sure what an MPV is, blah, 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 I've produced a number, <laughs> right? Down here, I have got an on-off switch for my data table. See? Now, so if you've been listening, is that a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional data table? Who thinks it's one? Who thinks it's two? Have a look at cell B1. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I only put it in big and red. Isn't that what, uh, uh, isn't that what, uh, what we were told in the PowerPoint presentation earlier we were supposed to do to make you notice? Not to Excel, people. We only look at numbers. Um, these are the inputs. All tables, of course, are two-dimensional, but these are the inputs, and here we've actually got the, uh, the, the years. This is just different calculations. If you want to see an example of a two-dimensional one, you're not going to trust me on this. You all, who, who here, the first thing they looked at was cell B1? <laughs> yeah, everybody here. I've got a discount rate and number of periods. If I change it to four, you can see I, it actually switches off. So I'm calculating it for different things to get my MPV. And what I've done here is I've created a data table where you see I've got the number of periods across here and the discount rate there. So you can look at optimization and other ideas and show things to go through. So it gives you some ideas with what-if analysis. Does that make sense? So that is scenario analysis. 
Um, the sensitivity analysis, I know, people often say, Liam, you're from Australia, you talk like this, you must be a sensitive guy. <laughs> Said no one ever. Um, let me explain. Sensitivity analysis is about changing one input at a time and seeing how it affects the outputs. And if you're going to do this, I would suggest you do it twice. Because I don't trust any of it. No, no, it's because of the fact that there's a reason for this. When we all build models, we have a model bias built in. If, if anyone built the same model, we'd all build different ones because we've got different experiences. We, some of us would build revenue in more detail, others would build costs or tax or whatever. And obviously, if we're changing one number at a time to see how it affects the output, then clearly numbers that have been modelled at a higher level, if we flex them all by the same percentage, would have more impact on the bottom line. Agreed? So what we use is sensitivity analysis to see if that's within tolerance. So the first time, we tend to do what's called a deterministic approach, where we flex everything by the same given percentage to see how it affects. So let's say I've come up with an output of 100. I don't know where it's come from, but we'll just go for 100. I'm going to produce a little table of six inputs that I want to look at here, and I forgot to delete that. And I'm going to actually flex it by minus 10%, let's say, and plus 10%. And let's put an apostrophe in front of that so the plus sign stays. Right, let's say then I've done this and I've, I've looked at my analysis. When uh, the unit price goes down 10%, let's say that goes down to 95, and that goes up to 113. Let's say unit cogs. When I do this, obviously if that goes down, then it's going to increase. Let's say this is a profit figure. So let's say that goes up to 112, and this goes down to uh, 94. Let's say this goes to 105, and 97. Let's say capex goes to uh, 140 and 65. Let's say I've got no debt. Ha, I wish. And um, then what I've got down here is tax, and we'll say that goes 102 and 97. And you wouldn't just type these numbers in, you'd have done your analysis. Over here, Here's something I prepared earlier. I've worked out the gap using the ABS function, which isn't just a type of breaks. I've worked this out. And then I've ranked it using the rank function and put in a thing here to check for duplicates. The reason I've got duplicates is because I need to plot them on a chart. So once I've done that, I can go down here and re-rank them. So I've got the numbers 1 to 6. And I've used XLOOKUP. Look, I've used sequence and XLOOKUP. I did learn something today. So I've actually got these so I can plot uh, what the, the range is one way and the other. And then I can just plot this on a chart. One tornado chart. How cool is that? Yeah? Just by going, going through and modelling this quite quickly. It's, it's, this is one of the things we can do to actually have a look, and that might tell me, you know what, my capex is dominating this model at the moment. I need to model this in more detail. And we go through a few iterations, and then once we've done that, we would no longer move this by plus or minus 10%, and it has to be symmetrical on the first one, because some things will be revenues, some will be costs. We would then go and flex them by what we think they'll move by. And what I'd give you as a tip there, what do you think you'd beat nine times out of 10, and what do you think you wouldn't beat nine times out of 10, and use those as your ranges. And do, but you can't do that till you trust the model. So you have to do it twice. Make sense? So if I go back to my tornado chart example I had earlier that I showed you at the beginning here, this one, I got my simple P&L example. This was the numbers, you remember, I came in with. If I actually go through this, uh, and let me just close the other file because I don't need this. Does it, did this all make sense to everybody? Could someone explain it to me then, because I'm lost. What I've done here is I've got my inputs. My number wasn't 100. It was a more realistic 454,344. And what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to go to this page, which is my sensitivities that I'm going to uh, grow, and you just change one input at a time. So let's assume we've moved it by 10%. Always remember the percentage you could use has got to be something that won't break the model. So if it's a case of you move it by 20%, but that's going to mean you're going to have to open another warehouse or something like that, then that might be too big a number to flex in the model, just from a realistic perspective. So if I put 10% in there and leave everything else alone, what happens is my 45,000 increases by 10% to 49.5. Everything else stays the same, and my profit goes up 136,000 to 591k. Yeah? If I then go here and change that to minus 10% and put that through, 
What happens now is this goes from 45,000 down 10% to 40,500. Everything else stays the same, and it goes down to 318. It, in this case, this is symmetrical. Not all models are going to give you symmetrical answers, but it's going to be 136K the other way. Now, you're thinking, oh my God, is he going to go through all of them here? <laughs> yes, I've decided because you've all been horrible to me. I'm, no, I'm, I'll do one more just to show you here so we've got enough numbers. I'll put 10% in here, and I'll go back to this. Uh, and what's happened here, 75%. I've assumed a 10% deduction in, a reduction in, in this is, a, uh, it's, sorry, an increase is 82.5, leaving everything else alone. Increases it by about 15,500. You get the picture, Yeah. Rather than, who would like to do that for all their models and go through 300 inputs that way? That's what I thought. Would you like to buy a book, or a copy of my laziness book that I'm going through? Yeah, um, no, I couldn't be bothered either. I actually started an apathy club at, at university. Now, that's a lie. I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> what I've got here is I've put these numbers in. I've got a, a switch going on rather than the on-off drop-down which puts these tables. Now, what I've actually done is I've put the data tables on top of each other. This is a collection of tables. That's one data table, that's another one, and so on. The reason being, on the second run, I can change... At the moment, these are all linking to that, but I can change these to other numbers on the second run. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, so I can go through. Now, I'm not going to go through it twice. I'm just showing this here. So I've got all these. You've seen the 317, the 590, and the 438. What I've done is I've subtracted off the middle so you can see what the swing is. I've worked out the spread, made an adjustment for any tiebreakers to rank it, and then put it through here to create my gorgeous uh, tornado chart here that I can then look to see which ones are the ones I need to keep an eye on. Does that make sense? All right, how am I doing for time? I gather I've got about another 12 or 13 minutes. Is that right? Somewhere like that? No, but... Yes, but uh, yeah, we didn't start till goodness knows when. So, half five. What till five? I've got five minutes. I didn't start till five two. <laughs> okay. The last one I'm going to show quickly is the third one is simulation analysis. So this is when you want to actually put things through. Now, unfortunately, Tony stole a bit of my thunder in here in that he actually showed the formula, but I'm going to sort of explain what's going on here. So first of all, I'd like to have a good shout out to Tony. Thanks for that. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'll get you later. Um, now, I'm going to open up my simulations one here, and I want that one. Right, so we'll close this one now. So, what this is for is, just want to explain, be careful with simulations in here. So I've got here some values. So um, there is this thing, you know what a BLT is, don't you? You're going to have a bacon, lettuce and tomato. Well, one better than that is the CLT, the central limit theorem. Now, I'm going to send you all to sleep in the next couple of minutes here with that now. Essentially, if you're trying to work out and you're going to go through and you haven't got enough data and you don't know what the distribution spread is, one of the things you can work out if you're trying to build a simulation to take a sample and see what your range might look like is to actually take averages. So you, you, if you can know what the mean and standard deviation is of old data, you can actually take at least 30 samples and you take the average of them, put it all back, then you take another 30 samples or so, uh, work out the average, put them all back, and do that at least 30 times, so you've had at least 900 data points, you'll find that the actual distribution of those averages will be normally distributed. If you've got a better piece of information, use it. This is a fallback, but it's good because we've got this in Excel. We've got norm functions in there. Hi, norm. No, that's cheers. Sorry. So I've got a mean here of zero and a standard deviation of one, which is a measure of the spread. So within one standard deviation, you have 66% of the population. Within two, you get 95. And within three, you get 99.8. Yeah? What I've got here is with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, I can put from minus three up to plus three, taking me all the way through the range. And I can actually here work out my cumulative probability, which is the S-curve, the probability my value is less than or equal to minus three, is actually given by this function here. Norm.dist, and then it's going F18 is this value. So what's the probability my value will be less than or equal to minus three? with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. If you put true, it's less than or equal to. And if you actually put false, you get what here is going through is supposed to be what the probability is of getting exactly minus three. Well, hang on a minute, that's bigger than that. How can that be? 
What does the sum of all probabilities add up to? Yep, like Highlander, there can only be one. Except here, it adds up to 9.977. So we can't use it that way. So just be careful. I have to use this one here, because this is actually being used to calculate something else, and the explanation in Excel help is not right for that. So you can have a look at these files. I'll send them to you. I'll give you the email details in a minute or two. But what I want to do is I want to swap it around. I want to say I want to generate a number here, because this goes from 0 to 1. And I know a function that will generate me a random number between 0 and 1. The RAND function, the South African currency conversion function. Yeah? Use the RAND function, generate a random number between 0 and 1. And then I can convert it back to this using norm.imv. Make sense? The reason you use this rather than use uh, a RAND all the way through is, if you use RAND, it's what's called uniformly distributed, which means every value is equally likely. That's not the case. The ones around the mean are more likely. So this is why we use this little clever thing in here. So why is this all relevant? Imagine I've got some data here. I've got sales and I've got my standard deviation. Liam, I don't know what my sales and everything is. Well, look, if I put some numbers in here, and I'm just going to, let's just stay away. I'm just going to do good old, not use rand array, just go the old way, 100, 999, control enter. Right, and copy and paste as values. Right, if I want to work out the mean of that, I just go here equals average. Very ordinary function, that. I think it's quite average. Uh, and then here, I'm going to go and go standard deviation, stdev.s. What s? Because it's a sample, I'm assuming, here. And again, I just highlight all this, not knowing what the hell a standard deviation is. It doesn't matter. I'm using Excel. Must be right. And then I can plug these numbers in. So that's what I'm using to put here for these different ones. So it's, it's showing me the values in here. And what I've done is I've actually used the norm.imv function, and I've triggered it using rand. I don't care what comes out of that. It's just making it a vault so it will actually come back and will generate a random number between 0 and 1, which will therefore give me, well, this should go between 475 and 1525. If I keep pressing the F9 function, you will see it tends to hover around the average rather than go to the extremes. And the same with the foreign exchange and gross margin. And I've built a little mini model here. I've then created a 1,000 simulations here, a data table, and I built it just using, you know, you can just use a histogram or whatever to create this chart here, which shows me my normal distribution for gross profit or for foreign exchange or for gross margin or whatever. Pretty cool. Look, I've got about five minutes left for questions. I don't care what they say. If you want these models, uh, let me just go to the final slide here. Uh, my contact details are on here. But I'm happy to take questions for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Apart from, you know, where did you get your dress sense from? Let me move out of the way. Yes, sir. Can you be a mix? Uh, the call or um, simulation? Oh, okay. Monte Carlo simulation. How can you take, uh, for example, 100 randomly uh, exhorted uh, data from a list about, uh, don't know, uh, many thousand? Data. Well, that is what th this is Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo's method of sample. So this yeah. is just saying it's taking a random number. That's exactly what this is doing. This is a Monte Carlo simulation. I know. I have a list, for example, 100,000 uh, numbers, and I'd like to take uh, randomly uh, 100 numbers. How can I do it and sum them, for example? You can you can just pick but right, you can just pick them uh, using the ran function ran between yeah. if you're doing if you if you're just going to pick them randomly. Or if you have that many, uh, and it's not so much about the distribution, and you're just looking more at the range, and you're not so bothered about exactly the shape of the curve, you might start to stratify and take numbers out of the stratified groups. That tends to be known as Latin hypercube, which always sounds like some sort of weird dance. But you can actually go through that way and pick them out, uh, so you pick a random number out that way. 
It depends what you're doing. Excel can only go so far without using VBA or using third-party software. I'm assuming here there's no correlation between them. They're all independent. Once you start building in factors like that, this sort of thing falls over because of the fact that they, they, these are just assuming everything's independent of each other. If you're going to have those sorts of relationships in there, then you start moving into third-party software like Solver, Crystal Ball, At Risk, and the others that are out there, Decision Tree. And there's, there's um, apologies to anyone was, if they're a sponsor and I've missed out their, their particular one. But there's lots of them out there that can do that for you. There's actually sampling software that will do it too. Any others? Kelia, uh, thank you for the presentation. And um, this material is a little bit tougher than the other things because there is a lot of mathematics and statistics in it. So thank you for the jokes. And my question is in relation to that joke. Uh, uh, regarding the, the okay. M MVP and how you're becoming an MVP. So my question, which dialog box is smaller? The, uh, the data table dialog box or row high dialog box? No, this was, we, we, that was the <laughs> argument. John, John Peltier was looking at row height. Apparently, data table is the smallest. Oh, we on. measured it. We measured it to the pick. The, seriously, uh, the, some of these guys will tell you, Ken was there. We did. We, we were in a pub in Auckland, and we actually went through, and we measured them to the pixel. Measure it with what, then? <laughs> yeah, he just sat there and got drunk. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. Okay, we're a little late. Uh, uh, let's thank uh, Liam. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for the first time in Bulgaria Excel days.